this song? Don't worry about who sang uh, It's in the Baptist hymn. Well, it's not in our hymnal. It's an old one that uh, is entitled, In Times Like These. In times like these, you need the Bible. The second verse of the song goes, In times like these, you need the Bible. In times like these, oh, be not idle. Be very sure, be very sure, your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. This rock is Jesus, the only one. This rock is Jesus. Um, <clears throat> it ends by saying, be very sure, and then the echo is, I'm very sure my anchor holds and grips the solid rock. Jesus is the Word of God, and I want to talk this morning for a few minutes about the Word of God as it is first and foremost. That's why God designed it. Um, Psalm chapter 85, verses 8 through 11 is the text that I'm going to use. I want you to listen carefully because that's exactly what the psalmist says. I listen carefully to what God the Lord is saying, for he speaks peace to his faithful people. But let them not return to their foolish ways. Truly his salvation is near to those who fear him, so our land will be filled with his glory. Unfailing love and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Truth springs up from the earth, and righteousness smiles down from heaven. Did you hear what the psalmist said? I've said it twice already, but let me say it again. The psalmist says that he listens carefully to what the Lord is saying. That is an admonition that I... I don't think we could spend too much time being uh, forceful about it. I mean, we need to remember that we need to listen carefully to what the Lord is saying. How do you do that? Obviously, you do it with His Word. The Word of God is first, and it is foremost. When we listen carefully, it isn't just so that we can hear and then do what we please, because that's not God's plan. There's always the possibility of doing that because we humans have free will, don't we? Uh, didn't God bless us with that, the ability to choose? So we could hear God's word, we could read God's word and say, oh, that's nice, I really enjoyed that. And then just live like we please. But we really can't do that if we want to honor God because that would not be honoring God. That would be lip service. That would be saying to God, yeah, I believe few examples uh, in our national life. God rejects the murder of the unborn, does he not? And yet our Supreme Court doesn't think so. God requires humans to be heterosexual. Our Supreme Court does not think so. To listen carefully implies receiving the information and then acting in obedience to God's will. This is an old expression that I love and I use very frequently. You're Behavior tells me what your belief really is. Believing results in behaving. If you believe something, you will behave that way. What do we call it when somebody says one thing and does another thing? It, it begins with an H and ends in hypocrisy. It, it's hypocrisy. To say one thing and to do something else shows us that your words are what? Empty, valueless. And it's not supposed to be that way between us and God. We're supposed to hear the truth and then believe and act. Believing means behaving. The idea is to gain truth and then put that truth in relationship with righteousness. In short, what the psalmist says here is we are to practice the kiss of truth. Truth is understanding what is right. When I say something to you, like two to two is four, you know that that's true because you learned it at kindergarten or first or second grade. Two plus two is four. You say that's true. But then why would I act like two plus two is seven? It doesn't make sense, does it? It's a false way of living. We are to practice the kiss of truth, which is understanding what is right, getting the information right, and then righteousness, which is doing what is right. Whatever comes in as truth must be behaved as truth. This is the kind of integrity 
that we need to have as human beings, whether we are leaders in a society or whether we are ruled over in society, doesn't make a difference who's in charge. God requires us to live truth. And the point is very simple here. It does not, and this is a thesis for everything I'm going to say this morning, it does not matter what a majority of humans think. God requires obedience. Man's Supreme Court is nowhere near the authority of eternity's Supreme Court. You know, when we forget that, or if we remember that but we forsake it, we court war with heaven. Throughout history, Scripture has always been foremost in authority. I want to give you very quickly six. I was going to, I was just about to do this. I want to give you six. <laughs> I want to give you six of the most important historical Christian leaders who agree with what I've said so far. That the believing, the understanding, the kiss of truth with righteousness. Truth is understanding what's right. Righteousness is doing what's right. So uh, they, they understand with that they understand that thought as being true, that we are not only to hear God's word, but we are to do God's word. What does James says, say about that? We, we Not to be just hearers of the word, we are to be doers as well, right? Everywhere in the scripture you'll find that premise. Six of them, very quickly. First of all is Peter. Peter was very fond of saying as he talked to people, it is written. What was he talking about? The, the newspaper, was he talking about the latest play tablets? He was talking about the word of God. When Peter said it is written, he was backing up what he was saying. Second person that I want to talk to you about is Paul. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15 that he should study scripture hard and he should teach it diligently if he wanted to be approved by God. Uh, study to show thyself a uh, workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Work rightly dividing the word of truth. Paul said to Timothy, you study hard and then you teach just as hard. You put everything into teaching others what God's word says. Peter, Paul, and then there's Martin Luther. You know who he is. He's, uh, he is the founder of our Lutheran brethren, the way they worship. Uh, he stood on a principle he called, or has been referred to as sola scriptura. Sola meaning only scripture. You know what that is. It's scripture, the word of God. Martin Luther was being harangued for believing in the Bible, and he said, you know, I can't stand any other place. God help me. It's sola scriptura. It's just God's word upon which I stand. Peter, Paul, Martin Luther, and then we can't leave the Presbyterian brethren now, so let's talk about John Calvin for just a second. John Calvin was the founder of uh, what is today Presbyterian uh, worship. John Calvin wrote 944 pages of theology. Let me tell you something, reading theology sometimes is pretty, pretty thick, pretty deep to get through. You know, it's not something you want to start while you're already drowsy. You know, it'll put you to sleep quicker than reading the Bible. But he wrote 944 pages of theology, and every bit of it points to Scripture as authoritative. John Calvin. And then for the fact that there's always one in the crowd, Baptist, uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, preached for more than 57 years. I'm sneaking up on 40, well, it's a little bit more than 40 now, but I'm, I'm around 40 years, and man, I'm worn out. I can imagine how Spurgeon dragged himself through the days. Uh, 57 years, and he preached an average of seven to eight times a day. Week, I'm sorry. <laughs> Boy, that'd be one preaching machine if it was seven to eight times a day, huh? Seven to eight times a week. And in his spare time, he wrote 150 books. Now, I haven't read all of them, but I do know this. I've, I've read a lot of Spurgeon. I've read a lot of his sermons. And every bit of what is in his sermons and every bit of what is in his books bends the knee in one direction, Scripture, God's holy word. And then for the purest Methodist among us, let's not forget John Wesley. John Wesley had a way of looking, or the way he said God looks at life, and how we must interpret life, 
And he said there are four pieces of that, hence the name quadrilateral. Scripture, reason, tradition, and experience. Let's unpack that for just a second. Well, we, we know what scripture is. Um, what about uh, tradition? Tradition is not, oh, we have homecoming on the third uh, Sunday of, uh, what is it, October? May. Boy, I only missed it by five months. <laughs> Fourth Sunday, see that? Uh, you know, I, I don't know the traditions that well. That's not the kind of tradition that John Wesley was talking about. He's talking about what has been taught by the Christian faith over the last 2,000 years. That's the tradition. And incidentally, it goes back a lot further than that, all the way back to the book of Job, the first book of the Bible, where Christian tradition melds with Jewish history. Uh, the tradition that has been taught is that God is who he is and there's only one of him. Uh, now, he's expressed in three different persons. So this is the tradition that we might call doctrine these days. And then he said reason. Reason is simply a matter of using your faculties to ferret out nonsense. For instance, I could say to you, I'm going to sit in that pew, but you know, I don't, I don't want to sit in it over there. I'm going to sit in that pew over here. So I'll sit down on that pew over here. Your reasoning tells you what? The preacher's gone around the bend, right? He's lost his mind. If he thinks he's going to sit on that pew, which is over there, and he's going to sit on it over here. That just doesn't work. So you have to use reason when it comes to interpreting life. But then there's the last one, and that is experience. And he's not talking about somebody just being older so they've made enough mistakes, they've found out how to do things. He's talking about experience as in the times when God has moved, and it is, it's knowable, it's understandable, it's almost palpable. The experience that I, I told you about with Kenneth Powers, we shared that this morning, where Kenneth, uh, Kenneth went to the doctor and it was incidental to what they eventually operated on, on him about. He went to the doctor for one thing, pain here and there, and the doctor in, in checking things just said, all right, let's, let's do an MRI. Not an MRI, a CAT scan, let's do a CAT scan. And Kenneth didn't expect that that was gonna happen, and he didn't know he had another problem, but when they did the CAT scan, which the doctor just thought, as an afterthought, we ought to do that, he found a mass that needed to come out by the surgery. You see, that is an experience. When you start to realize that, hey, I didn't know I had a problem, and suddenly, because of something else, I'm led to the doctor who's led to do another CAT scan and find out the real problem. That is an experience of God moving before we can even think or ask. You had that kind of experience you, where you realized God was on the job and you didn't have a clue that he was on the job, but he did something for you. And then afterward, you realized that could have only been God. That could have only been God. Uh, Elizabeth was talking about one of those God moments that, that happened to us yesterday. Uh, she was, um, we've had one of these weeks where, you know, Besides surgeries here in hospitals and visiting and BBS over Mount Zion, you know, we had going back and forth like crazy all week long. So she didn't get a chance to do what she normally does. She tries to get the bulletin done by Tuesday. Well, it was last night, you know, and she was sitting there, and I was watching a little TV at the time, and she was sitting there. She just about had her finger on the button to print the bulletins. And I said to her, hey, Hold on, Megan just sent me a message. Megan Fry was head of BBS at Mount Zion this week. She just sent me a message. I called Megan. I said, what's going on? And she said, I made a mistake in the, in the report that I gave you for Bolton. And Elizabeth sitting over there just having a, a hallelujah time, you know, right? <laughs> that she didn't press the button, you know, 35 sheets down the food, right? But you know what? God interrupts at times, you know, and, and does stuff like that. And so we were able to make the correction and she printed the bulletin. The point is simply this. The experience that John Wesley is talking about is not learning to do stuff better. It's his, it's your experience with him that makes all the difference. But let's get back to that first one. Scripture, tradition, reason, experience. Scripture. John Wesley said, even though there are four ways that we must interpret life, he said, scripture is number one. He didn't necessarily say it that way. He said it with everything he did, John Wesley did. 
If you were to check out John Wesley's sermons, you cannot find a stray thought or a seminal thought that's not backed up by Scripture in some way. Matter of fact, John Wesley quoted Scripture so many times in his sermons. Every time I've ever read a sermon of John Wesley's, and I've read 70 or 80 of them, there's no less than about 10 references, at least in every sermon, of Scripture, where he, he would quote Scripture and then make a comment about, I mean, his sermons went on for two hours, folks. Blessed are you. <laughs> you know. The point is simply this. If you read all John Wesley's sermons, and by the way, he preached about 40 times in his 70 years. Uh, if you read every bit of John Wesley's sermons, you get credit in heaven for reading the Bible twice. Because <laughs> he repeats the Bible back and forth. Today, I think, John Wesley would cringe that his preachers know much more of the book of discipline than they do of the book of books. There are all kinds of decisions made about right and wrong and what to do for our country and the police force and law and family and culture. What to do about living. It may not be possible to figure out what's best from all the arguments that you constantly hear in media and present on TV. But scripture never leaves us in doubt where that's concerned. Listen to what Psalm 119 says. You can probably quote it with me. I have hidden your word where? In my heart that I might not sin against you, against God. So, letting truth, that which is right, understanding it, letting truth and righteousness, which is doing what's right, let truth and righteousness have that kiss. That's our job. Because when you do that, you listen to God and you do things God's way, and it will always land you on the right side of history. Because it's a perfect kiss. The kiss of truth and righteousness. Understanding what's right. Doing what's right regardless of what the world thinks. A perfect kiss. Hymn number 600 is all about that. It's the wonderful words of life. Sing them over again to me. Wonderful words of life. It is the word. Those wonderful words of life. Let's stand together. Let's stand. Thank you.
cleanses us by his power, by his Holy Spirit, cleanses us, makes us fit for his use. So, take the words, those beautiful words, and go and be fruitful this week in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.